Okay, can everyone see my screen? We're assuming? Yes, yes. So I, so I should begin? Yes. All right. So again, my uh, presentation is entitled Bird Migration in South Florida. And this is the latest uh, incarnation of this presentation, which I first gave about four years ago. So the presentation will focus on seasonal migration. And I define seasonal migration as a predictable, seasonal movement of birds between their breeding and their wintering grounds. So this is the kind of migration that most people think of when they think of migration. There are actually at least 12 different kinds of migration. Uh, some of those other kinds of migration are forms of seasonal migration. And I may talk about some of those other forms, but this presentation is going to focus on seasonal migration, which is predictable and it, ha it happens every year, twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall. So some of the questions that I hope to answer in this presentation are, which birds seasonally migrate to South Florida? So the first half of my presentation will focus on that particular question. Then in the second half of my presentation, I'll talk about things like, why do birds migrate? When do they migrate? What triggers their migration? How do they know when it's time to migrate? How far do they migrate? How do these migra migrants navigate? How do they know which way to go and when to stop? What hazards do these migrants face? And finally, how can you help migratory birds? Because this is a presentation on bird migration in South Florida, I need to make sure that everyone understands what I mean by South Florida. So South Florida are the seven counties that are either totally or partially south of Lake Okeechobee. So those counties are Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, Monroe, Collier, Lee, and Henry County. So this presentation is going to talk about bird migration that's specific for all seven of these counties. If I did a presentation that was bird migration in all of Florida, it would be a different presentation than the one I'm about to give. If I tried to do a presentation for just one of the seven counties in South Florida, say just for Palm Beach County, that would also be a different presentation. So keep in mind that how I'm going to be describing bird migration is going to be for those seven counties. So what I needed to do to figure out which migrants we're going to be talking about is I, um, I have a checklist that uh, was created by Tropical Audubon Society that is called um, the Checklist of Birds of South Florida. So I went through that list of all the birds that are known to be in South Florida and I separated into them into six different categories. Resident birds, like the Northern Cardinal, which represent about 23% of the birds on the list. Introduced birds, like this monk parakeet, which represent 6% of the birds on the list. Vagrant birds, like this banana quit, which is actually the largest of the six groups, that's 28% of the birds on the list are considered vagrants. 15% of the birds are transients, like this Blackburnian warbler. 24% are winter visitors, and 4%, like um, these blue winged teal, and 4% are summer breeders, like this swallowtail kite. So once I had the checklist separated into these six categories, I had to decide which of the birds in these six categories are migrants. So I had to come up with a definition for what is a South Florida migrant. And the definition that I came up with is, it's a South Florida migrant if it spends part of each year in South Florida and part of each year somewhere else. So the key here in this definition 
is each year. It's predictable and it happens on an annual basis. So that immediately eliminates the vagrant category because vagrants by definition, their, their uh, appearance in South Florida is much more random and unpredictable than a migrant should be. They may show up one year, but they may not show up for several years after that. So I'm really not going to be talking about the vagrant category in this presentation. For the exotics, all of those parrots and bulbuls, wet red whiskered bulbul and spot-breasted orioles and minas and all of those other birds that have been introduced to South Florida, there's really only one in that category that can be considered a migrant, and that's uh, European starling, which uh, in the wintertime, European starlings from north of South Florida will sometimes move into South Florida for the winter. But other than that, the introduced species, the exotics, are really not considered migrants. So I'm going to focus on the other four categories. I'm going to focus on the transients. There are 48 of those on the list. Transients are those birds that pass through South Florida during the spring and or the fall. They're not usually present during the summer, nor are they usually present during the winter. The key there in this definition is usually, because there's going to be some exceptions to the rule for all of these categories. For winter visitors, there are 111 on that checklist. These are birds that typically arrive in the fall, they leave in the spring, but they're not usually present during the summer. Now, sometimes winter visitors will start showing up as early as July or August, but none of the winter visitors breed here. Same thing with transients. None of, none of the transients breed in South Florida. The third category I'm going to be talking about are summer breeders. There's 28 of those on the list. These are the birds that breed here in South Florida, but they're not here all year. So they arrive in the spring, they breed, they'll then leave sometime in the fall, but they're usually not present during the winter. Now, the fourth category that I'm going to talk about may surprise you. It's the only one that's left and it's the resident birds. Now there are about 24, 25 resident birds that are true resident birds and that they never leave South Florida. But there are 73 species, from my count, 73 species of birds in South Florida that are considered residents in which the population changes seasonally due to migration or post-breeding dispersal. So as an example of that, I have here the black neck stilt. The black neck stilt is found in Florida all year. It breeds in Florida. It winters in Florida, but not as, as much as as many birds as breed in Florida. Transient black neck silts really expand the population. So in starting right now in July and continuing for the next couple of months, especially in places like the Everglades agricultural area, there'll be many more black neck stilts that are moving through South Florida than at any time of the year. So since it breeds here and it's found here all year, I have to consider it a resident, but I'm going to talk about how with 73 of these residents, their populations do change. They do expand and contract over the course of the year because of migration. So let's start talking about each of these groups one at a time. I'll start with the transients. Now, when most people think of transient migrants, they think of warblers like, like this Blackburnian warbler. And there are 16 different warblers that are considered transients. The only time that you can really see them in South Florida is during spring migration or fall migration. Now, there are some exceptions to that, like last year, 
a golden wing warbler, which normally you only see in the spring and the fall. Well, last winter, one stayed all winter at Wakotahatchee wetlands. There are some of these transients that are more common in the spring, like the black pole warbler is much more common in the spring. There are others like the bay-breasted warbler that's much more common in the fall. But you, these bird, none of these warblers breed here. None of these warblers uh, are found commonly during the winter. If you want to see these warblers, you really have to look for them. The best time to look for them is during the spring and during the fall. Same thing with these eight shorebirds. This is now starting to be a good time to see shorebirds like upland sandpiper, semi-palmated sandpiper. White rump sandpiper are more common in the spring than in the fall. But coming up in August and September is when we'll be looking for buff-breasted sandpiper, solitary and pectoral sandpiper, and, the, and two of the phalaropes, Wilson's phalarope and redneck phalarope, are all much more common as transients than any other time of the year. Again, none of them breed here, and most of these birds don't winter here. Same thing with these three uh, species of terns. We're going to start to see black terns in the Everglades agricultural area, probably starting at the end of this month. Common terns are most common as spring or fall migrants. And Arctic terns, when conditions are right, usually when winds are blowing from the east, if you go to beaches on the Atlantic coast, you have a chance, usually in late spring, to see Arctic terns. So those are considered transients. Some of the other species that are considered transients, scarlet tanager, rose-breasted grosbeak, blue grosbeak, bobolin, dick thistle, orchard oriole. Though orchard oriole, that's now, there's um, records now of orchard oriole actually breeding in uh, Belle Glade in, in Palm Beach County. So this is a bird that's right now that's considered a transient throughout most of South Florida, but who knows, eventually this will start breeding more widespread in South Florida, and I'll have to change it from a transient to a breeding bird. There are a few more transients. There's Mississippi kite, black billed cuckoo, bank swallow, all of these flycatchers, eastern wood peewee, all-sided flycatcher, yellow-bellied, Acadian, alder, and willow, are all transients, as is Philadelphia vireo, as are five thrushes, wood thrush, Swainson's thrush, very great cheek thrush, and Bicknell's thrush, which many of you hopefully got to see this spring in a couple of places in Palm Beach County. So those are the transient birds. If you want to see those on migration, spring and fall is oftentimes the only time, and it's for all of these, it's the best time to look for. Let's move on now to the winter visitors. When birders think about winter visitors, oftentimes ducks are among the first winter visitors that they think about because um, the winter duck population or the duck population in South Florida uh, really expands dramatically in the wintertime. So again, these winter visitors are all birds that typically arrive in South Florida in the fall, they'll stay for the winter, they'll leave in the spring, and none of these birds will breed here in South Florida. So all of these ducks are winter visitors. Blue-winged teal, gadwall, American widgeon, northern shoveler, northern pintail, green-winged teal, canvasback, redhead, ring-neck duck, lesser scop, black scoda, hooded merganser, red-breasted merganser, and ruddy duck. All of these shorebirds are considered winter visitors. Most of them arrive in the fall, most of them will stay throughout the winter, and then they'll head out in the spring. So American avocet, which is pictured here, black bellied plover, semi-palmated plover, piping plover, spotted sandpiper, sandaling, red knot, ruddy turnstone, dunlin, wimbrel, greater and lesser yellow legs, western, least and stilt sandpiper, marble godwit, both long-billed and short-billed dowager, Wilson snipe, 
American woodcock, and offshore, for the most part, red phalarope are all winter visitors. We have quite a few other winter visitors to go through. There's common loon, there's horned grebe, there's American white pelican, which now sometimes is found here during the summer, but they don't breed here. Northern gannets offshore are winter visitors. Three different kinds of rail, Sora, Virginia rail, and very rarely yellow rail, and American bittern. All of them are winter visitors. So where these go, ringbill go, herring go, lesser blackback go, great blackback go, and bonapartes go. Just here from fall through spring, as is Forster's turn. If you remember the great razorbill invasion of 2012, you'll remember all the razorbills that came through Florida that winter, starting right around the time of Christmas bird counts. Now, normally razorbills and other alcids are considered vagrants, but that year there was a major uh, invasion of that species. Uh, a lot of people think that it's probably Superstorm Sandy related, that somehow that, uh, affected their food supply and they ended up all coming south for that winter. We may never see that happen again, but for that year they were uh, a winter visitor in very impressive numbers. There are several hawks that are only here during the winter, Northern Harrier, Sharp Shin Hawk, Broadwing Hawk, and Swainson's Hawk. short eared Owl sometimes shows up during winter in South Florida. Our three falcons are winter visitors, peregrine falcon, merlin, and American kestrel. A couple of night jars are here just during the winter, whippoorwill and lesser nighthawk. Belted kingfisher is considered a winter visitor. It's really, it only starts showing up in about August or September, and then it'll stay until maybe March or April, and only rarely do they stay during the summertime. Yellow-bellied sapsucker is the only one of Florida's eight woodpeckers that is not here year-round. It's only here from fall through spring. These flycatchers are only here in the wintertime, eastern Phoebe, least and brown-crested flycatcher, western and tropical kingbird, and scissor-tail flycatcher. These two vireos, blue-headed and yellow-throated, are considered winter, vi winter visitors as is tree swallow, ruby crown kinglet, three different wrens, house, marsh, and sedge, American pipit, cedar waxwing, gray catbird, American robin and hermit thrush, and these sparrows, savannah, chipping, clay-colored, grasshopper, swamp, white crown, salt marsh, nelsons, and lincolns, plus American goldfinch. Now the waxwing, the robin, and the goldfinch are kind of a special kind of migrant. They're called eruptive migrants. So they don't always appear in large numbers every year in South Florida. It's only when food supplies aren't adequate further north that they'll come this far south every year. So some years there may be waxwings or goldfinch or robins in large numbers but most years they can be sometimes hard to find. Those, at least in Miami-Dade County, the last three or four years have been really good years for cedar waxwings. Lots of warblers are only here from fall through spring and are considered winter visitors. So yellow rump warbler, palm, black and white warbler, oven bird, yellow-throated, American red star, worm-eating, black-throated blue, black-throated green, Northern Water Thrush, Magnolia, Cape May, Orange Crown, Wilsons, and most years a few Nashville warblers. Yellow-breasted chat is also a winter visitor, as is, ironically, summer tanager is here in South Florida, usually a winter visitor. So fall through spring as are painted buntings and indigo buntings, as are Baltimore Orioles, and especially in Palm Beach County, yellow-headed blackbird is a winter visitor. So those are all of the birds that you 
can't find at this time of the year. You have to wait until fall for them to start to arrive. They'll be here through the winter, and then they'll be leaving us again during the spring. Let's now talk about the summer breeders. These are the birds that are breeding here right now, like the swallowtail kite. So there are several birds that come to South Florida to breed. So they arrive sometime in the spring. The swallowtail kite will arrive as early as February. They'll breed during the summer, and then by the fall, they'll be gone back to their wintering grounds. So all of these terns are summer breeders. The least tern, which um, Scott just talked about, that there's a breeding colony at, uh, in Broward County this year. For sooty terns, bridal terns, brown noddies, you have to go to the dry tortugas to see those breed, but they're annual summer breeders there. Roseate terns also breed in the tortugas and also in the keys. And a few gullbill terns are still breeding, from what I understand, in Palm Beach County. So all of these are considered summer breeders. Yellowbill cuckoo is a summer breeder, as are these three night jars, common nighthawk, Antillian nighthawk, and Chuckwill's widow. Chimney swift is a summer breeder, as are these two flycatchers, gray and eastern kingbird. Two vireos are summer breeders. Red-eyed vireo, which breeds in the interior in Big Cypress, and black-whiskered vireo, which breeds mostly in the Keys and some coastal areas in Miami-Dade, Collier, and Lee counties. These three swallows, purple martin, and now barn swallows and cliff swallows, which years ago were just considered transients, are now breeding in South Florida, mostly in the northern part of South Florida, like in Palm Beach County. So I've now shifted those from transients. I now consider those to be summer breeders. Prothonotary warbler is also a summer breeder, like red-eyed vireo, just in the interior, in the cypress swamps of Big Cypress and Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. Now let me talk a little bit about a few birds that don't quite fit into any of the six categories. And the first few birds that I'm going to talk about, they're all summer breeders, and all of them, like the um, red-eyed vireo and like the prothonotary warbler, they only breed in the interior of South Florida. So ruby-throated ruby hummingbird is one of those birds that it breeds in South Florida, but only in the interior. But the thing about ruby-throated hummingbirds is that it, come fall, come September, they'll start to arrive in coastal residential areas. They'll stay through the winter, and then they'll leave during the spring. So while ruby-throated hummingbird is here all year, any given individual ruby-throated hummingbird may not be here all year. We really don't know where the summer breeding ruby-throated hummingbirds go after the breeding season. Do they stay in the interior of Florida? Do they fly south for the winter? Do they come to coastal areas? We really don't know. So even though they're here all year, even though they're summer breeders, there's still some of the individual ruby-throated hummingbirds. Most of the ruby-throated hummingbirds that we see during the year are actually winter vi visitors. So I'm putting them in two different categories. They're summer breeders, some are summer breeders, and some are winter visitors. Same thing for blue-gray gnatcatchers. They breed in the interior, but in another few weeks, blue-gray gnatcatchers will start to migrate down the coast and we'll have them in coastal residential areas from now until the spring. Same thing with northern perula. Breeds in the interior. Winter visitors are here from fall through spring. Common yellowthroats breed in sawgrass marsh in the interior. 
but migrants and winter visitors will be in coastal areas from fall through spring. Pine warbler, they breed during the summer in pine habitat, like in Everglades National Park, but from fall through spring, we'll have them in coastal residential areas. So none of these five species really fit uh, perfectly into any one category. Same thing with the next three examples. These are also summer breeders and winter visitors, but the difference with these three examples is that uh, the summer breeders are of one subspecies and the winter visitors are of another subspecies. So for willets, the eastern subspecies, species semipalmatis, they breed in the Florida Keys and in coastal areas on the Gulf Coast of South Florida. But it's the western subspecies that we see most often as a migrant and a winter visitor from fall through spring. Same thing with prairie warblers. We have our own subspecies of prairie warbler that breeds in coastal mangroves, especially in the southernmost part of uh, South Florida. The prairie warblers that we see most often though are of the nominant race that migrate south into South Florida in the fall and we see them through the winter until the springtime. Yellow warbler, same thing. We have a subspecies of yellow warbler that breeds here in South Florida that's called the golden yellow warbler. Sometimes it's called the Cuban yellow warbler. And like the prairie warbler, they also breed in uh, mangrove coastal areas, especially in southernmost South Florida, the Keys. During the fall, we'll get several different subspecies of yellow warbler, three in fact, that move through South Florida as migrants. So they'll start moving through South Florida within the next few weeks. They'll, a few of them, some of them will stay for the winter, and then we'll see a few of them migrate back through South Florida in the springtime. So what category do you put these in? They're all summer breeders, but they're also winter visitors. And because probably none of the individuals of these species are here all year, you can't really put them in just one category or the other. So I have to put them in both or at least these two categories. We can also talk about some pelagic visitors to some pelagic migrants to Florida, um, birds that you can usually only see if you go offshore. These are all species that don't breed here in Florida, but they pass through as migrants. So brown booby is a species that you can see offshore, um, mostly in the Florida Keys, just about all year round, but none of them breed here. So you can't call them a summer breeder. You really can't call them a winter visitor or a transient because they, they could be here all year. With these three shearwaters, Audubon's, Quarries, and Great Shearwater, they are mostly summer visitors. So they'll start arriving in offshore waters in South Florida sometime in the spring. They may be here during the summer and they usually leave during the fall, but uh, none of them breed here. Same thing with these the three storm petrels, Wilson's, Van Rumpf, and leeches. Usually arrive in offshore waters in the spring, leave in the fall. These two Jaegers, parasitic and pomeran, are just the opposite. They usually arrive in the fall and they'll be in offshore waters throughout the winter and usually head north to their breeding grounds in the spring. So they're more of a winter visitor. Finally, let's talk about those resident species whose populations change seasonally due either to migration or to post-breeding dispersal. So I gave you the example of the black neck stilt, but there are actually 72 other birds that are considered residents. They're here year round, 
but their population expands at different times of the year due to migration or due to post-breeding dispersal. So some of the birds like magnificent frigate bird and white crown pigeon and probably mangrove cuckoo, their populations expand during the summer when birds from the south, from the Caribbean, come to South Florida during the summertime. Most of the birds on this list are winter visitors. So turkey vulture is a classic example of a red resident species whose population expands very noticeably in the winter because of birds that migrate south from their northern breeding grounds. So like I said, most of the birds on this list fall into the category of winter visitors that are, are augmenting the resident species population. And then there's a few birds on this list like roseate spoonbill and wood stork and burrowing owl and red-headed woodpecker that their movements either in or out of South Florida seem to be more related to post-breeding dispersal than any kind of migration. So spoonbills and wood storks may move um, out of Florida after their breeding season. In the spring, they may move up to central Florida. Some ros roseate spoonbills uh, move back and forth between South Florida and Cuba. So a lot of that is more related to post-breeding dispersal than it is to an actual um, seasonal migration. With red-headed woodpecker, um, the post-breeding dispersal sometimes leads red-headed woodpeckers to fly as far south as the dry tortugas. So red-headed woodpeckers don't migrate out of North America. So when a red-headed woodpecker shows up in a place like the dry tortugas, it has to be because of post-breeding dispersal, that they just dispersed a little further than they intended to. So I added this group of birds to the presentation to try to make um, the understanding of migration in South Florida more complete. Because previously, I really didn't discuss resident species, but the reality is that most resident species actually have individuals that migrate in and out of South Florida at different times of the year. All right, so what, that's the end of part one of my presentation. So now let's answer a few of the other questions that I presented at the beginning of my presentation. And the first is, why do all of these birds migrate? Why don't they just stay in one place? Well, the main overriding reason why most birds migrate is because they typically experience some kind of seasonal change in the availability of the resources that they need to live. So birds that migrate, they typically leave areas of low or decreasing resources and move to areas of high or increasing resources. And by resources, I mean things like food, nesting locations, and daylight. All of these things are resources that change over the course of the year, that they increase and decrease over the course of the year. And as these resources decrease, these birds have adapted, they have evolved to rather than compete for scarce resources at times when the resources are scarce, they migrate to a place where the resources are more abundant. So that's why migration has evolved as a strategy for dealing with seasonal changes in resource availability. So what are the advantages of migration? Well, birds that nest at higher latitudes than South Florida, it provides them less competition for nesting locations. It provides abundant food sources like insects or plants, depending upon what the birds, what their primary food sources are. And they take advantage of increased daylight hours 
to find more food for themselves and for their nestlings. So all of these factors allow more young to be raised. And the more young they can raise, the better it is for the population. Wintering at lower latitudes, on the other hand, avoids the harsh winter weather at higher latitudes. And it also avoids competing with the resident high latitude species for scarce food sources during, that occur during the winter time. So what triggers migration? How does a bird know when it's time to start migrating? Well, it's any combination of things like changes in day length that they sense is, gives them the sense that it's time to migrate. Changes in temperature could be changes in food supply as that resource starts to dwindle. It tells them it's time to migrate. And then just a genetic predisposition. So birds are genetically wired to know when it's time to migrate. So when does migration begin and end? A lot, of, a lot of birders ask, when is spring migration? When is fall migration? Is there a beginning and an end to it? Well, if you look at, I've chosen 11 migrant species. I've chosen three um, breeding birds, summer breeders. Here's the key, the color key to uh, how I've done this. So three summer breeders, purple martin, swallowtail kite, I'm a nighthawk. Three winter visitors, blue-winged teal, eastern phoebe, and yellow rump warbler. Three transient species, cerulean warbler, upland sandpiper, and swainson's thrush. And two birds that fall into that uh, summer breeder and winter visitor category, blue-gray gnatcatcher and ruby-throated hummingbird. So if you look at the calendar for each of these species, for purple martin, they're a summer breeder, but the first purple martins start arriving from their wintering grounds in Brazil. They start arriving in South Florida as early as January. So they're a very early migrant. Swallowtail kites, another summer breeder, is also an early migrant. They start to arrive from their wintering grounds in Central and South America as early as February. Common nighthawks are a summer breeder that, that arrives a couple of months later. They usually don't start to arrive until April. So the purple martins are here uh, until the last ones leave in October, the swallowtail kites. Most of them are gone by September. The common nighthawks, most of them are gone by October. With um, wintering birds, with uh, winter visitors like blue-winged teal, the first teal will usually start to arrive as early as August, and then they'll stay through the winter, and the last blue-winged teals will leave South Florida, usually as late as May. Now, occasionally some uh, blue-winged teal will stay through the summer. That may be birds, young birds, or birds maybe that, are, that don't have um, the health, they have health issues that prevent them from going up to their breeding grounds. So that would explain why a few ducks sometimes show up in the summertime, but for the most part, these winter visitors only start arriving in the fall and then will leave in the spring. With Eastern Phoebes, they don't start arriving in South Florida until October, and then the last of them are gone by March. So they're here for a much shorter period of time. But yellow rump warblers, oftentimes they don't show up in South Florida until November, and then they're here until April. For transients, like the cerulean warbler, you have two chances to see them in the spring, look for them in March and April, and then you have to wait until July, August, and September when they're moving back south for the wintertime. Upland sandpipers, usually start appearing in, um, eight, they, in the spring. They're here in April and May. They're not very common. They're not very commonly seen during the spring migration, much more commonly seen during fall migration when they start arriving in July. So the first few should start showing up in the Everglades agricultural area 
maybe by the end of this month or early next month, and they'll be here in August and September. Swainson's thrush also uh, moves through in the spring in April and May, but they don't usually move through again until September and October. For those birds that are here year round, but individuals, some individuals are just summer breeders and other individuals are winter visitors, with the blue-gray gnatcatcher in the interior, they're breeding in April, May, and June, but then the migrants will start to arrive in South Florida in coastal areas in July, they'll spend the whole winter, and then they'll leave in March. Same thing with ruby-throated hummingbirds. The breeding birds in the interior will be there from March through August. The um, migrant and wintering birds won't start arriving in the coastal areas until September or so, and they'll be here all winter. And the last of the ruby-throated hummingbirds, the migrants at least, will have left by April. And then again, if you want to see a ruby-throated hummingbird, you'd have to go into the interior. So what do these 11 species show you? Is that there's really no beginning or end to migration. That birds are migra migrating through South Florida just about any time of year. And are every time of year or throughout the year, there's some type of migrant that can be seen here in South Florida. So what time of day do these birds migrate? Well, it depends on the species. If they travel during the day, they're called a diurnal migrant. migrant. So vultures, hawks, kites, falcons, birds of prey are typical diurnal migrants. And they will travel during the daytime to take advantage of rising thermals. As the day heats up, air will rise and that helps those birds of prey to keep aloft. Nighthawks, swifts, and swallows are also typically diurnal migrants. But the reason for them uh, migrating during the daytime is more to feed on insects that are only active during the day. On the other hand, nocturnal migrants are those migrants that travel at night. So ducks, shorebirds, and songbirds, like the Swainson's thrush, mostly when they migrate through South Florida, they do so as, at night. That's to avoid predators like hawks and, and vultures and, uh, or kites and falcons, but it's also to take advantage of the cooler temperatures at night and calmer air at night so it's easier for them to travel at night. So how do they navigate? How do they know which direction to go? A lot of migrant birds will use landmarks to help them to navigate. So they'll use coastlines or rivers or mountain ranges. Some will use wind direction. Some are able to um, feel changes in barometric pressure that will help them to uh, know which direction to go, or if a hurricane is on its way, they'll know how to get out of its way. A lot of, a lot of migrant birds seem to have internal maps or compasses that seem to be um, photochemical in um, the way it works. Uh, those chemicals um, occur in their eyes and they're able to um, read things like magnetic fields. So there are several different kinds of maps and compasses, internal maps and compasses that birds use. When birds want to determine what direction to go, they'll use the sun if they're a um, diurnal migrant. If they're a um, nocturnal migrant, they'll use the stars. And at any time of day, They'll use their magnetic compass to read the magnetic fields to get a sense of how to navigate using those magnetic fields. To determine if they're in the right place, to determine the right location, there are maps that they use, and it could be either a map that uh, reads magnetic fields, or they can even use their sense of smell to determine whether or not they're in the right location. So, 
Uh, birds are not using Google Maps. They don't have uh, those kinds of uh, technologies, but they have some amazing technologies. And uh, their abilities are astounding. Their ability to find the same place year after year, how a hummingbird can find the same backyard every year is just amazing how they can do it. And these are the tools that they have to use to use them, to, um, to do that. So how far do birds migrate? Well, it depends on the bird. There are some birds that are short distance migrants. They may only cover a short distance or in the case of uh, what are called altitudinal migrants in places where there are mountains, they may move from higher to lower elevations on a mountainside. So a good example of a short distance migrant here in South Florida is a short tailed hawk. Most short-tailed hawks in, in Florida will uh, breed in central Florida. A few of them breed here in South Florida, but most of them breed in central Florida. And then in the winter time, a lot of those birds from central Florida will move down to South Florida for the winter time. So they're only migrating a couple hundred miles at most between their breeding ground and their wintering ground. So that's considered a short distance migrant. If they're a medium distance migrant, they may cover distances that span from one to several states or provinces, but usually a medium distance migrant will remain in North America. So American woodcock is a good example of a medium distance migrant. It breeds as far north as Canada, but it will not winter any further south than South Florida. So some American woodcocks will actually winter in places like Everglades National Park, but they never migrate further south than that. Long distance migrants are the ones that have ranges that extend from United States and Canada in the summer, all the way to Mexico and even further south in the winter. So black pole warbler is a really good example of a long distance migrant. They will uh, breed in boreal forests in Canada. Um, so in the springtime, we'll see them move through uh, South Florida on their way to those boreal forests. But then in the fall, instead of migrating back down the same way that they came in the spring, in the fall, most black pole warblers will actually migrate from their breeding grounds in Canada directly over the Atlantic Ocean all the way to their wintering grounds in um, northern South America, in Colombia and Venezuela and Brazil. So that's an amazing migration that they're, they're flying nonstop across entirely across the Atlantic Ocean from Canada all the way to Earth. Now, of course, there are some long distance migrants that beat even the Black Pole Warbler. The Arctic Tern is uh, a really good example of uh, a super long distance migrant. They breed in the high Arctic and uh, they winter in the Antarctic. When it's summertime down there, that's their wintering grounds. So on an annual basis, they're annually flying two times a year, almost from pole to pole. So incredible migration abilities on some of these birds. All of these birds typically will use just a few different routes to get from their wintering grounds to their breeding grounds, and then their breeding grounds back to their wintering grounds. And those migration routes we refer to as flyways. So in North America, there are four flyways. So these flyways are simply generalized routes taken by, taken by migrating birds between their breeding grounds and their wintering habitats. So the two flyways that pass through South Florida are the Atlantic Flyway and the Mississippi Flyway. And then further west in North America are the Central Flyway and the Pacific Flyway. So these are just generalized routes 
that um, most birds will take. Uh, obviously, there are some outliers on either side of uh, any of these four flyways, but generally speaking, this is the routes that birds take, and the route that a bird takes depends on where their breeding grounds are in North America and where their wintering grounds are, either here in Florida or further south. So most of the birds that pass through um, South Florida using either the Atlantic or the Mississippi flyway, uh, for the Atlantic flyway birds, these are mostly birds that winter in the Caribbean. For the Mississippi flyway, these are more often birds that will um, nest as far south as Central America. So all of these flyways uh, connect different habitats. Uh, up in their breeding grounds, many shorebirds and ducks will breed in tundra habitat. Uh, many songbirds breed in both boreal and temperate forests. Other songbirds and some shorebirds will breed in grasslands and shrublands in the midsection of North America. Coastal beaches, salt marshes, marshes and estuaries could be breeding grounds for some uh, coastal birds, shorebirds, uh, gulls, terns, but they can also be wintering grounds for birds that breed further north. Freshwater swamps and marshes like the Everglades can be um, breeding grounds for some birds, but also wintering grounds for others. And then tropical forests can be wintering grounds for many birds that breed um, much further north in North America. So these flyways connect all of the breeding habitats to all of the wintering habitats. Now the birds don't fly nonstop from their breeding grounds to their wintering habitats. They usually have to stop several times during their journeys at what is, what's referred to as stopover habitat. So stopover habitat could include places like parks and even your backyards. So even your backyard is important for many migrating birds, in particular songbirds, that could use your back, backyard as a place to rest and refuel on their journey either north in the springtime or back south in the fall. A lot of these migrants face natural hazards during their journeys. There's the physical stress of the journey. Um, they're flying very long distances and they're burning up uh, a lot of their fat reserves and some birds will eventually start burning up muscles to get to their destination. They may face um, inclement weather. They may face a cold front or a storm that may um, force them to uh, come down earlier than they had wanted to or may force them off course. And then any bird that's flying, has to fly during the daytime, has to worry about being eaten by a predator. So there are lots of natural hazards to migration. It's tough to be a migrant bird. But we've now made it even tougher, that because of things like habitat loss and the loss of food sources, like these are horseshoe crabs that many shorebirds feed on their eggs during their uh, northward migration in the spring. Non-native predators like outdoor cats, pesticides, collisions with windows or being disoriented by bright uh, city lights, or illegal trapping are all hazards of migration that are caused by us that uh, add to uh, the natural hazards that uh, that birds naturally face. So climate change has now become uh, another uh, human-caused hazard of migration that um, many birds now um, need to adapt to changes in their food supply during their migration and when they arrive at their breeding grounds because 
the climate is changing uh, when plants will bloom and when uh, insects hatch. And if these migrant birds are not adapting to those changing in the timing of um, how plants and insects are changing as an adaptation to climate change, then they may be in trouble. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, studies have now shown that many species of migrant birds are now seriously in decline. In the last 50 years since 1970, uh, we've lost about 2.5 billion migratory birds. That means there are 2.5 billion less migratory birds now in North America than there were in 1970. So that's a 28% population loss since 1970. So as one example, Baltimore Orioles, two in five Baltimore Orioles have been lost since 1970. So that's a 40% population decline since 1970. And uh, it's probably due to all of the uh, factors that I just listed, habitat loss right through climate change are uh, seriously negatively impacting these birds. So what can we do to help these migrants? Well, one thing we can do is we can protect bird habitat. And one of the ways that we're protecting bird habitat is through the Important Bird Area Program. This is a program that was created by an organization called BirdLife International, which partners with uh, National Audubon Society in the United States. And uh, IBAs, they provide essential habitat either for breeding, for wintering, or as migratory stopover habitat. So on this map, all of the areas in green are IBAs. So there are over 11,000 IBAs in 200 different countries around the world. In the United States, there are over 2,500 IBAs uh, covering um, 378 million acres. Focusing a little more on South Florida, all the areas that are in red are important bird areas in South Florida. So these include federal properties like national parks and preserves, national wildlife refuges, so Everglades National Park, Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge are examples of important bird areas that are um, under federal control. State managed lands like uh, lands managed by South Florida Water Management District, including the stormwater treatment areas, state forests, state parks, wildlife and environmental areas, wildlife management areas are all important bird areas. As are some county parks and natural areas, as are some private areas like Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, which is uh, a National Audubon Society property, and properties um, uh, owned by, uh, controlled by, managed by the Nature Conservancy are all in the Important Bird Area Program. So that's one thing that we can do to try to uh, help migrants. Another thing that people can do as individuals is to work to create what are called bird-friendly communities. So these are some of the ways that individuals or families can make a difference for migrating birds. So planting natives in your backyard is a good way to help migrants. Natives provide birds with stopover food sources, including fruit, seeds, insects, and spiders. Landscape for birds, use plenty of layers, including understory, ground cover, shrubs, and trees, and provide cover in your backyard. So leave snags for nesting places uh, and stack down tree limbs to create brush piles. Create or protect water sources in your yard. All birds need water to drink and bathe. Just remember to change the water two or three times a week uh, during a uh, mosquito breeding season. Try to reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides and herbicides. So using fewer chemicals in your home keeps wildlife, pets, and people healthy. Keep cats inside. So keeping cats indoors protects birds. Indoor cats live longer too, and they're healthier. Prevent window collisions, so put up screens, use window decals, 
uh, close drapes and blinds when you're not at home to prevent those window collisions. Help the birds to stay on course by shutting off bright lights. So keep the blinds closed, turn lights off at night when you're not using them so they don't get distracted. And finally, uh, extend a bird safety net beyond your backyard. This may be something that we can continue again after this pandemic is over. So contacting your local Audubon chapter to learn about opportunities to create healthy habitat, not only in your backyard, but in parks and beaches and other places in your community. So if you'd like to get some more information about all of the things that I've talked about in this presentation, some good resources are the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the American Bird Conservancy, National Audubon Society, and local chapters. My local chapter is Tropical Audubon, and your local chapter is Audubon Everglades. That's it. So now how do we get to questions? That's on the bottom of the screen. So if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and Brian will try to answer them. There are a couple there already, Brian. Okay, let me... Oh, I think I left. I'm not seeing the bottom of my screen. Can you still hear me? Yeah, so Brian, let me read you some of the questions that we've already gotten. With okay. climate change, which birds have changed their migration, breeding, or behaviors? That's a really good question. So, which birds have changed over, say, the last few years? I guess that's what the question is asking. Is at least, as, I guess, climate change has really had its effect over the last 40 years, particularly. So, do you know any birds that have particularly changed their migration, breeding, or behaviors? Well, a lot of the uh, changes that are climate change related are very subtle. So um, birds that uh, once appeared in a particular place at a particular time are now maybe arriving a week later in the springtime. So uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a, a little early to tell. Um, what what the implications are going to be we're seeing we're seeing changes but we don't know uh, if those changes are going to be so impactful to the birds that it may cause some of those birds to go extinct um, so time will tell on that but we're certainly seeing some changes in um in South Florida, like for example, with swallows that take the barn swallow, for example, that we're now starting to see barn swallows breeding much farther south than we ever did. I mean, years ago, barn swallow wasn't really a breeder in South Florida. And uh, now they're uh, found breeding, especially since, um, they've found bridges as a good place to, uh, to breed. Uh, they're now breeding much farther south. So we are starting to see some changes, but I think it's still too early to really see the major changes, especially here in South Florida. In more temperate areas, you're probably going to see um, changes uh, come much more quickly and impacts come much more quickly than in South Florida, which is subtropical. So uh, the changes between summer and winter are not as dramatic as there are, they are in other places in North America. So Brian, here's another really good question. Uh, why do some bird species breed inland in South Florida and winter in coastal uh, South Florida instead of migrating north or south? For example, the ruby-throated hummingbird, which you mentioned. Well, those species seem to be very uh, habitat specific when it comes to their breeding location. 
So that's why, for example, the ruby-throated hummingbird, the red-eyed vireo, the, um, the northern perula, they only will breed in a cypress swamp. But uh, birds that of that, those species that breed further north, uh, once they're finished breeding and they head down to South Florida, they seem to be much less particular about um, where they're going to spend the winter. And probably also they're using coastal areas because those are not the areas that are used by most breeding species in South Florida. So they have, the migrants have the coastal residential areas more to themselves during um, their migration and during the winter time. And here's another good question, Brian. Uh, what kind of, uh, of odors would birds follow for their odor map? The specific kinds of odors. Uh, well, probably uh, birds like um, vultures, they, can, they have a very good sense of smell. So um, they, can, they can, you know, they can smell, they have much better sense of smell than eyesight. So um, they can use that sense of smell also to determine where it, when they get to where they want to be uh, for their wintering grounds. Uh, maybe for a bird like a ruby-throated hummingbird, they're able to smell the, uh, the flowers that, uh, that they're looking for. So when they get to an area, when they can smell those flowers, then uh, maybe they can use that sense of smell um, to help them to, to know that they're in the right place. And here's another question. Um, can you speak about weather patterns and fallouts? Sure. Um, here in South Florida, uh, during migration, uh, it's very much weather related. So uh, as I mentioned before, um, birds, their uh, migration path can be altered by uh, running into a weather system, a cold front or a thunderstorm, things like that, which can knock them down or um, uh, make them uh, change direction and alter their migration course. So. Birders can use that information to uh, get a sense of uh, when is a good time to actually see birds as they're migrating through. Because of course, when the weather is fine and uh, there's uh, you know, no bad weather to uh, impede the bird's migration, they'll fly straight through and we never see them. It's really only when, um, they hit a natural hazard like a thunderstorm that uh, we may be able to see them. So looking at weather patterns, knowing if there's going to be a front that comes through, looking at the direction of the wind. Um, during the springtime, we're more likely to see the trans-gulf migrants, the migrants uh, that are uh, migrating uh, during the spring from Central America to Florida, across the Gulf of Mexico. We're more likely to see those birds here on the east coast of Florida when the winds are blowing out of the west, because it'll redirect those birds much further west to our side of Florida than they would normally um, take, the path that they would normally take if the winds were not out of the west. When, when they're out of the east, uh, those trans-Gulf migrants tend to stay on the West Coast. So looking at uh, wind direction and looking at whether or not a storm is going to hit, in particular, if a storm hits overnight when songbirds are migrating, that next morning is oftentimes a good time to go out and look for migrants. That's great, thank you. And, and here's a question about uh, bird, bird uh, fatalities. Are wind farms killing vast number of migratory birds annually? That, that seems to be the case that, um, uh, especially out in the Western United States or really any place where there are wind farms, it's in particular, it's uh, impacting uh, birds of prey, uh, eagles and hawks um, oftentimes will 
um, will fly through those blades and, uh, and never make it through. So um, the larger birds are being impacted by wind farms more than the smaller birds are. So we have one question about your presentation. Uh, sure. Someone was wondering if the information on your slides, if that uh, is, will be available. I know that we will be posting this uh, video of the presentation on our, uh, on our um, uh, YouTube page, but will, can people somehow see your presentation elsewhere? At the moment, no. Uh, I could probably ask Tropical Audubon Society if they can publish it um, maybe on their YouTube page or something like that. I'll have to check on that. But right now, it won't be available uh, anywhere other than uh, the video that you're recording right now. OK. And finally, uh, someone asked to see the uh, your last slide, because uh, some website information was mentioned there, your final mm -hmm. screen. Okay, so let me go back to that again. And while Brian is doing that, I just would like to thank everybody uh, who joined us this evening. Uh, it was an incredible presentation. I'm sure you all learned a lot and uh, have probably even more questions that you can't even think of asking right now. Uh, and next month we'll be meeting on uh, August 4th uh, at seven o'clock again. And we hope it'll go a little smoother than this evening. Uh, we'll try to get our act more together for you. We'll do our best. And Brian's pulling up that slide. I'm trying to, but for some reason it is not opening. Hmm. Brian, can you say the website that was listed there, whatever the website was at the end on that final screen? Uh, well, there were the three organizations that, uh, that I listed first. That's uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, the American Bird Conservancy, and um, National Audubon Society. And then the two local chapters, uh, my chapter, Tropical Audubon, and your chapter, Audubon Everglades. Okay, and maybe we can get that information to the interested uh, party at some point. Anyway, um, if the, since there are no other questions at this point, uh, finally, again, I'd like to thank Brian, Brian Raposa for joining us, and I think I called you Raposo earlier by, by mistake. Uh, no and, problem. Yeah, and that was a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. And thank you everybody again for letting us into your homes. Have a great evening and we'll see you again soon. Okay, thank you.